to another episode of the Boombast Cast yes. with the one and only, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Matthew Fisher. Wow. And his mere lowly sidekick, the great and wonderful Alexander Hawk, which is me. Beep, beep. Well. And we are happy uh, today. We are uh, going to be talking to and interviewing uh, Mr. Happy Anderson. He has been in some uh, great TV and movies, uh, everything from Mindhunter uh, to uh, Bird Box and, uh, Bad, Boys 3. and Bad Boys for Life. A uh, very man. great actor out wow. of New York. And uh, we're so happy to have him here. And he's fucking killing it. Every time I turn around, I'm seeing him. Um, this, this, this I'm, I was excited to have this gentleman on, you know what I mean? When I found out we were having him on, the Hawkman hooked it up. And, uh, you know, going, doing some research, I go, I know this fucking dude. You know what I mean? And then all these things started flashing into my head before I even looked up their credits. You know, I know we just, me and the lady just went to go see the new Bad Boys movie pre-COVID, which... Which is weird because it feels like uh, a couple months ago, but now it's like almost two years ago now that we got to do uh, this. But I remember him. And it's funny because when I seen his role in Bad Boys, uh, Bad Boys for Life, all I could think of is I said, you know who should be playing this role? Alexander the Hawk. It was a perfect role for Alexander the Hawk. But I happy did a fantastic job with it. And now that we're going to be interviewing him in a little bit, I almost feel that Happy should have got that role over you. You know, I know you hate to hear that stuff, but, you know, the man was made for it and did a great job with it. He's got a good eval. I love how he's got a, his, he, you know, whether he's playing like a super like gangster characters, you know what I mean? Um, like, what was the, what was that? Sh- what was the show? Uh, uh, the Nick. The, the Nick, Nick, yeah, where he's playing yeah. Jimmy Fester there. That's oh, yeah. good times. Uh, he's gang super gangster in that, which was good. You know what I mean? Even when he was on Bright as the interrogator, I thought that was really cool, too. I support that to the fullest. You know what I mean? Uh, I like him. I like him a lot. You know what I mean? Hails from High Falls, New York City. Or High Falls, New York. That's not exactly the city, I think. Yeah. I could be wrong. But, yeah. Uh, so, Hawk, when did you first stumble into this actor? Well, um... I say the first time that I saw him and I would say have connected with him uh, as, as a fan would be uh, Mindhunter. That was the first time I really saw him and uh, thought, well, this is a really cool actor. He's doing a great job. Yeah. Then um, actually um, I have a friend, uh, Dennis Hurley, we both know who we were talking and uh, he made a comment that uh, both of them went to Ithaca College together. Um, and of course, after that, I decided to friend him on Facebook and I've been following his career ever since. I've been looking at some of his older stuff and uh, and it's it's great. Every time you see him on, on screen, you know, he, he commands your attention. Yeah, he really does. Yeah, yeah Mindhunter is a show that uh, you brought to my attention. Yeah, there was a very cool show for anybody out there that want to go check it out. Netflix, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's still on Netflix. Yeah, with the Finch, you know, executive produced and directed by the Finch, David Fincher, uh, old 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 pal of the show. You know what I mean? Um, hell yeah, we'll hop hop into that. You know, some of my favorite things to talk about is you know, some of these glorious people that, that they they get to work with and that that I I love so much that. I would not never want to jinx myself in a 2021 situation, but you know, who's to say if we were, if we are ever able to link up and be able to work with these folks uh, ourselves one day, you know what I mean? So it's good to have these firsthand uh, accounts of what goes down and uh, happy uh, is no exception, man. Happy has worked with a lot of cool folks and happy is a cool mother trucker himself. So uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there we go. Hey, what's going on? Hey, how, you, how doing? you doing? All right, how are you? Oh, Pretty good. Hey, Pretty good. Hey. good. Sorry about that. I mean, my phone had to be totally rebooted, rebooted. Sorry. Yeah, no worries, man. That stuff happens all the time. Zoom's yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, it, it fucks up for no good reason. Sure does. Because I know you need it. That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> good to good to be on the digital airwaves. Uh, you as well. What's that behind you? You have a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff. I got some uh, some Ghostbusters records. 
just action figures. I kind of keep it with my uh, my um, what's that office space term? The fu- the feng shui, the uh, the uh, pep, feng shui, the pep. Yeah, the feng shui works too. I try to give, <laughs> kind of give it the uh, the, the welcoming feel. So if yeah, they, man. If they don't want to look at me, they can look at what's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes what's behind you is 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 so interesting, Matt. What can we say? The, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to give us a break. I know. Well, that's why we. That's how we get people in. We get them. Yes. Well, we pull them in with that, and they stay for the. They stay for the show. You know. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, at least. Well, uh, one thing, um, uh, both uh, Matthew and and myself. Uh, we're uh, filmmakers. Uh, I, I'm more of on the acting side. He's more on the making of uh, the uh, you still are. movie side, the director side, the producer side. Um, <laughs> but I mean, one of the things that I think is, is the case with everyone like us that get into making films or acting and that kind is we all have a story. We all have a story of that instant uh, incident that really convinced us or, or, or like invoked the passion uh, for what, what we, we wanted to do with our lives. And, and the question I have for you, what was that incident for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to perform and I actually I started off as a tap dancer as a kid. Oh, uh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I wanted to find, I just, I loved being on stage. So I wanted to find different ways. And I had a crush on this girl in early high school. And she was like, oh, they're doing auditions in town for, because my high school didn't do plays. They're doing auditions in this theater for Gypsy. And I was the only guy who could tap dance, but I couldn't sing. So they, <laughs> they were like, well, I don't know what to do with this 15 year old who sings like Tom Waits. It makes no fucking sense. So. Uh, but so they gave me the only non-singing tap dancing boy role. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, you know, I, I knew I wanted to act, but I couldn't sing. So I was like, what should I do? And there was an equity theater in town that was doing the play Equus. And I got, cat, it's an old Peter Schaefer play uh, about the boy who stabbed the horse's eyes out. And, uh, and I was cast as a horse <laughs> and <laughs> Alan and Alan Strang's understudy. And I grew up in upstate New York, so this was in New Paul's, New York. And, uh, and the cast was all uh, either professional actors from the city or college students and me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and just being a part of that and watching those two, the psychology of watching the, the psychiatrist and the, and the boy interact and learning that role, I was like, ah, now I know what, what I want to do. I want to play sick fuckers like this for the rest of my life. Hell yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Don't every don't anybody out there hate on tap dancing because I've wanted to tap dance ever since I seen that Cosby show episode. Uh, he puts the uh, sand down and challenge. Down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean um also was looking in I noticed that uh, you did a lot of um uh, Shakespeare on Broadway, mm-hmm. right? Well, I, I did one Broadway show, but I've done Shakespeare all over the country. Well, I mean, I've always been a fan of the Bard and uh, and the different plays in the theater. Um, unfortunately, just not really have the opportunity to do a lot of that nowadays. Uh, but out of, I mean, is there like a favorite Shakespearean play or like... Um, a, things that he uh, deals with that really uh, uh, talks to you uh, that you really uh, like uh, to get into? Uh, yeah, well, you know, again, in high school, the thing that drew me into Shakespeare was the Scottish play, Macbeth, and I've gotten to do that show three times. I played Macduff, Macbeth, and the Porter. <laughs> My epic turn as the Porter at Texas Shakespeare Festival. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, when I went to grad school, I went to uh, college in Ithaca, New York, Ithaca College, and then I went directly to grad school, Indiana University. And, and we basically only studied Shakespeare, not only, but that was like a very heavy focus. And, uh, and I was convinced that's what I, that now this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was do Shakespeare all over the country until that actually became my vocation. And I was like, you know, I'm not 25 anymore. I'm tired. I need to make a living. I got to figure out how to make anything work on camera because this is beating me up. But I, the, the, uh, 
the idealism that I had out of school was uh, the heightened language and the storytelling is beautiful and the poetry is beautiful. And, 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 and if you can make the language work for you, that the language really cradles the actor. And like, you just have to be the, just, you just have to let it happen. You don't really have to do much of anything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things that I, I always loved about Shakespeare, um, especially since, um, you know, they have all these great long monologues, but uh, I always found that it has kind of like a, um, almost singing, like a, a, a singing feel to it that, you know, when you get in the rhythm that, you know, these long daunting monologues at first, you might be like, how can I do this? But when you get into rhythm, it just flows off the tongue and just, you know, kind of really brings you in, I find. Oh, de it's definitely like learning a song. It, it, it's, it's no different, uh, you know, uh, especially the ones in verse. Uh, in prose, it's a little less so, but uh, obviously. But um, And also, uh, I think when you learn or when I learned exactly how punctuation works differently in Shakespeare than it does for us in uh, uh, 21st century English, um, it's it's just so much easier to memorize and just talk a song. I mean, it's beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, um, one thing I was I was uh, checking um, in two thousand seven, uh, you did uh, two different uh, films. One was uh, Brutal Massacre of Comedy with the uh, late Gunnar Hansen and uh, yep. David Naughton. And you also did uh, Redacted, which was uh, directed by uh, Brian De Palma. I mean, yeah, I mean, those, I, those are my... yeah, I mean, I just have to ask, I mean, they're, they're like, so like opposite sides and, and getting to do them all like, you know, at the very beginning, how did that happen? Well, those are my first two movies I ever did. Um, those, those are my first two jobs, really, non-theater jobs. Um, <laughs> and it, ha I mean, I just, you know, I was taking anything that I could get is, is the short answer as to how it happened. Um, uh, uh, Brutal Massacre was more of an accident. I, I, uh, I was there for one, I didn't have an agent yet and I was there for one audition and I stumbled into the wrong audition and they hired me. So, <laughs> so that was good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Redacted, which was a very, uh, uh, crazy, wonderful experience but i had uh i had just gotten an agent and it was my first movie audition and i happened to get it i thought it was going to be like that the rest of my life it was not um uh but uh yeah he uh, he wrote it as well and uh and there were many rounds of auditions and we shot it in amman jordan and i hadn't been to that part of the world before and i ha i hadn't i'd had only done one other movie before so it, it was it was crazy it was um it was a wild, wild experience. So the, the rumor I heard was that originally Brian Del Palma was supposed to direct Brutal Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> so it just kind of it just kind of fell over into yeah. the next film. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, how, how is it? You know, Brian Del Palma is an iconic filmmaker. You know, well, what's it like uh, just being on that set around? You know, seeing him do his thing. Very intimidating. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, my, I couldn't. It was, they purposefully uh, uh, cast a, a bunch of unknowns. And I was like, well, no one's more unknown than me. So yeah, I'll, I'll do it. But, uh, you know, but the, the other guys had a lot of experience. I had almost none. So when he walked on the set, it, it was, it seemed like the emperor or something. It was yeah. really daunting. And my first scene was a three page monologue. And the guys had already, the other guys had already been there for a few weeks. I had just arrived and I had to deliver this monologue to everyone. And, and my first take was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my, my nerves turned to cockiness. I was like, I'm going to knock this out of the park. And, <laughs> and I finish and he goes, okay, happy. Let's try it again. This time you're not in a fucking play. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And I had to fake it till I made it. I watched how other people were moving and talking and I was like, Oh, I guess I'll just do it like that. And then it was fine. And I, I, I love the choice that a director makes for the, with like actors that aren't as, aren't as well known yet. I love that choice because it's a clean slate. Like the audience yeah. doesn't have to push other characters out of their head to, you know, to let this one fit in for this story. I love when they, you know, so and that's just a sign of a great director. Cause I'm sure the Palmer, I know that the Palmer kind of, he, he went, he's foreign now. He's outside of the States making. France mostly. 
Yeah, which is kind of like if you want to have free, you know, free reign to kind of do whatever you want, you have to kind of do exactly outside. right. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm glad to see he's still making films. It's funny because, you know, you know, the Palma, Abel Ferreira, there's a lot of filmmakers that are still going, making films that we don't even hear about anymore because, right. it, you know, they don't get released over here or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's and, right. And, and, and his, that movie was about an actual thing that happened in the Iraq war. So that's why it was so important to have people that the audience wouldn't have known because yeah. it was it was supposed to appear as if this was really happening, right. unfolding in real time. Yeah, yeah, you can't, yeah. you know. Yeah, so kind of uh, by by doing that, kind of making the story itself center stage instead of exactly stage. right, totally it's a big move. Yeah. yeah, it's a big move that studios don't really like to make that much, and you know, no. <laughs> big, big, no. you know. When they want, they want like a big some the actor to sell the film for it. You know, usually yeah. you see that. Unfortunately, you know, you know the, the, the actor's name sells it more than the story or whatever. You know. Yeah, well, because no one wants to take a chance with their money, right? You know, and you can't <laughs> blame you them to a degree. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I get unhappy when I lose five dollars. I can only imagine. <laughs> oh yeah, fifty million. I mean, exactly. I, I'd be a little, I'd be a little uh, perturbed. Yeah, for sure. Oh, come on. Money's only money, right? <laughs> it's, money, yeah. it's, in the, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? Like beauty. Whoever yeah. owns it and beholds it, loves it. <laughs> yeah. You and know, whoever it doesn't have it, wants it. So the, Can you, you see me all right? Yeah, I see you. We see you good. Okay. You know, so when, you, when you made that jump from the theater, the, from the stage to the screen, you know, mm. people that you became friendly with in the theater group, were they, I know oftentimes they'll kind of look down on that jump. You know what I mean? Because they feel like the real acting is in, in on the stage and not in front of the screen. You know, in, in I want did did they have that vibe when you when you were making your jump, your leap from it, or? Oh no! I mean, at a certain point, everyone realizes you have to make a living. Yeah. Um, and, and the money just isn't there in theater. Right. So, ideally, you, you you're very prolific in both, but it's very hard to strike that balance. And uh, you know, I hope to go back on stage sometime. It's just been a long time. Yeah, it's, a, you know, things have definitely flipped. Like right now you'll see when filmmakers would usually look upon TV, doing TV work is like a bad yeah, thing. I know. Now, like all I... filmmakers, all the direct, like film directors want to do TV because that's where the bigger audience is. And everything, that's right. You know? And more freedom and better and storytelling. Yeah. It's crazy. You have more freedom on TV than in a film. You know what I, I mean? Know. It's weird. I know. <laughs> Everything's flipped on its fucking head. Yeah. Well, actually, one of the things that I think is great about uh, about TV uh, is that I, I find TV gives you the opportunity, especially as an actor, to kind of uh, really delve into your character. I mean, when, when you're doing a movie and, and you're doing it and it has to be like two hours, you can only do so much, you know, character study yeah. or delving into. But when you're doing, you know, let's say three or four seasons and then you got let's say 10 to 20 episodes per season, then you get the opportunity to delve into the character and find the nuances that normally you wouldn't if right. you were just doing, doing a film. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I think that they're really starting to delve into even more now with TV. Um, I mean, back in the old days, it was more of like, well, here's an adventure, and, but it doesn't carry on to the next episode. But now everyone's delving into character arcs and all that. And that's why I think TV is really taken off when it comes to, you know, storytelling and as acting. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, and they're called the like prestige shows, you know, the, like, the ones that are shot like a 10 hour movie. You know, yeah. it's like, it's really the amount of time you have and things to, it's, it's, it takes a lot of pressure off everybody to have all the time in the world to tell the story correctly. Yeah. yeah. And I always think that it's, it's uh, because a lot of times when, when I'm watching a movie or, uh, and all that, you always feel like they're, they're, they're missing something. There, there could be more, yeah. more to it. And, and then of course you'd be talking to like someone from the, uh, from the film and they're like, Oh yeah, we had like this backstory. We shot these scenes, but they never made into the movie, and you're like, well, if it was put in the movie, the movie would have made more sense. <laughs> I know, I know, I yeah. know. A lot of that. Yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, it's, and like I said, I mean, I, I, I've, I've always wanted to be an actor. I always loved movies, that, but what I loved mo- most of all was the, was the, you know, creating a character and, and telling the story. And, you know, and I really think that uh, TV really has like off their game when it comes to that. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, the, the advent of all the streaming platforms. I mean, it started obviously with HBO and Sopranos and The Wire, but you know, as Netflix and, and Hulu and all that stuff came along, I mean, there's there's so much content uh, or availability for content uh, that you know. Obviously, a lot of the stuff that's out there is like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not into this. But then, for every one of those, there's a bunch of uh, like really, really like independent film 10 hour independent films where you, where you where you just get to love on the story and the characters and, you know like old scorsese movies except series i think that's what it is with the with the with the series is it's like those scorsese movies he's so talented with it that he, you're allowed to get intimate within that two hour span yes where now yeah. you, they they take these 10 hour long segments to let you really get intimate with the characters and their story and you know their lifestyle and everything so it's it's really more like reading a book, you know what I mean, nowadays. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. To go into the thing about how, like, theater people might not appreciate the film, getting into the film, you know, uh, I know you worked on some of the most biggest video games recently, you know, doing some voice for them. You know, well, how, yeah. did, how, how is that, you know? You a video game fan, first of all, or? No, I, I haven't played a video game since I was a kid, probably. Yeah. I don't even really care for them. And what's so funny is, uh, uh, like, when I got offered those jobs, no one told me what they were. Yeah. They were like, oh, Rockstar Games want you to come in today. Okay. And, and, and they give me the script, and I'm, I'm, I'm shouting curse words at a screen. And, uh, and, I, and then I find out what it is after it came out. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, you could have told me. I wouldn't have known what that was anyway. But yeah. I understand that you need to keep it secret. But uh, people love that stuff. Oh, and yeah. uh, I mean, my, my nephews go, not, they're more proud of that, of what really? I've done, than most of the movies I've done. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> I'll tell my nephew that we had a gentleman on that did a voice on GTA, and that'll be mean more than him than me being his uncle. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. But, yeah, the video game crazes took it over. It's gigantic. It's huge. You know, the, 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 they're now making movies about it. I'm, I'm sure there's probably yeah. TV shows somewhere about video games, you know. It's so wild. It is. And I so don't understand. I mean, I just go where they tell me to go and right. say what they tell me to say. But I, I so, my mind is so far removed from that world. I don't even, I, I don't think I fully appreciate just how popular and, and like loved and, 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 and like obsessed with these projects are. Yeah. Yeah, they really are. It's, um, I'm trying to think of another, like, especially like Grand Theft Auto. You know, you were Oof. part of the Max Payne game, I think, first, which was a big, that was a big deal. That got its own movie. Grand Theft Auto, I'm surprised it never got a movie. Yeah, um, yeah. One day it probably will. Uh, I think of the, the, the extreme, you know, NC-17 rating that will have of you know, the, the madness that happens within. But um, Totally. Yeah, you know what I mean? I'm surprised there was never a game for that. But yeah, kids love it. I mean, that's kind of like video games... It's weird because, yeah, when we were younger, it's like you start playing video games and you kind of drift away from it. And you're like, oh, you assume there's new ge- new generations playing new games, but you don't really ex- think it would be that huge. Like, it, <laughs> like, even when we were kids, it was like a big part of our life, but it's almost like yeah. 50 times bigger than it was then. Yeah, I, that's why I can't even, I mean, like, I loved Nintendo in sixth grade, but then I, like, kind of forgot about it. And yeah. now, I, I mean, like, I, I, I know that my mind can't grasp how big these are. Yeah. The video games do do anything cool for the people that are in it. Like when they re- hit a certain, like sell like a hundred million of them, do they send, I know like, because it's audio, it's kind of in a music world. I know like bands and acts, if they have their song in it, they'll be sent a plaque that, it, you know, played or sold so many. You guys got any, any like uh, pat on the back or anything? No, nah, nothing like that. I uh, get no. a little flyer, a little eight by 10, <laughs> little cutout or something. <laughs> no that that's still a whole thing going on with the unions and everything uh, oh really cause, well because that would be easy to track in terms yeah. of uh, getting residuals or whatever but it uh it, it's it, it's a battle that's on the back burner for now i i assume 
That's actually a really good point. I never even thought about the unions with that because you're doing a video game, you don't think it's a big deal, but these video games are selling more than films are. And they're, by they're far. Like, yeah, and it's like you buy a, a DVD for 10, 15 bucks, you, these video games are 60 bucks a pop. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you want to get, want to get them online, they're only 40, but that's still, you know what I mean? It's still a lot of money. And it's all going into the hands of, you know, whoever the distributor is. That's right. Yeah, there's that's a lot right. of money. I'm surprised. Yeah, I never even thought of the union with that. That's interesting. It's a, but every new thing is always a new battle. Right. Like, uh, like it's just now that we've like kind of gotten somewhere with the streaming platforms and, and stuff like that. So it, it just takes a while to catch up to the world because it's for if they cannot pay us for as long as they can, they will. Right. Because why 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 wouldn't they do that? Right. I mean, it just makes better business sense. But for them. Yeah. But eventually, most of the new content, it comes around and we at least get a little piece of it. That's good. Yeah, because there's so much floating out there. I know uh, I know the big executives got the, usually the people that don't need the money got their hand in the pie. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. that's how that goes. You know, you were also in cold and, oh, Alex, you were going to say something. Yeah, actually, it's funny because uh, we're on the same uh, wavelength. Um, I was going to um, make a comment that uh, you were in the movie Cold in July. Uh, and uh, actually, it's funny because Matt and I have a connection to the movie because we have uh, our friend, uh, Ken Holmes, who actually played the burglar in that movie. Yeah, good shot. Yeah, the guy yeah. who gets shot in the beginning. And I know she... Yeah, and, and at, at times like this, it kind of reminds, uh, at least it reminds me, how kind of small the community is. Even if, yeah. even if uh, you know you're, you're shooting in New York or in California, I mean, you're, you're bound to you know be working close with someone who then you know works with someone else who works with someone else all the time. Yeah. Yeah, the whole six degrees of separation. Um, but I mean, how, how was the experience on, on that film, uh, Cold in July? Oh, it was really nice. I mean, it was very brief. Um, what I liked about it was we're shooting in my hometown and I don't get up there that often because my folks moved down to Florida and stuff like that. But um, that was cool. I did. That was another one I didn't really know much about. I think it was one of my first uh, like straight offers. So, you know, I, 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 I like Michael C. Hall and uh, I liked the director very, very much. Um, Jim Mickle. Yeah, yeah. I really liked him. Uh, he's like a really smart, like intuitive, uh, good guy. Um, but you know, I had, I think I only had one scene with a few lines. So I just, I just kind of showed up and did it and it was great. And I think the movie was, in my opinion, really good. I mean, you know, I, I, I played a little piece of it, but it was, it was really a well done movie, I think. So, so was it around this time that you were starting just to get the offers instead of having to kind of come in and audition? Uh, it was, it, it, it was a mixture. You no, know, it was it was a mixture, yeah. and then and then it was only the last two or three years that almost all of my jobs were were offers. Um, although now that there's there's much less work, I'm back to auditioning a lot. So, yeah. you know what are you gonna do? I mean, who could have predicted this? So right, I know it's terrible. The COVID thing, it's and it ain't over. It's like uh, the fallout from it will be around, it'll be lingering for a while, unfortunately. Oh my God, I know. I'm I'm just glad to be fully vaxxed. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on that. Hawk, you, where, you where, huh? Where are you guys? We're in uh Massachusetts. Yeah. Which uh, just, where? Uh I'm in Whitman and he's in Andover. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh yeah. <laughs> we, like, we like to return to our hometown every now and then. <laughs> we never leave it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's yeah. Actually, it, it's interesting since you know we we stumble uh, upon the comment of COVID and all that. How how has it uh, affected you know the entertainment industry and I mean and everything there? I know that it's affected everyone in different ways, and I know it's really tough and and it's not over yet. I mean. Do uh, what do you think you know the future might hold for you know film, uh, TV, and all that 
in your corner of the world, New York, uh, anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a, a struggle for a while. I've only done one job in COVID. Um, and we got through it all right. It was out in Montana. And, uh, you know, we got it every other day. It was before the vaccines were widely available. And it was hard. I mean, I, I was grateful to work again. It had been a long time. But it's hard to get through it, you know, especially traveling. And, and then, you know, um, I almost said hibernating, uh, quarantining for 10 days or whatever it is. About the same. <laughs> uh, about the same, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and also, uh, not so much anymore, but for a while, a lot of projects were starting and stopping and starting. I mean, it's, it's just very, we're, we're all just, every line of work is just figuring out how to do this, how to go forward. Um, I think it's, it's gotten uh, somewhat easier with more and more people uh, vaccinated but it's still like a, it's still confusing and, and weird yeah yeah but, i mean hopefully uh hopefully things will you know maybe i mean i i like to think that everything will go back to normal but uh you know we'll we'll see i mean yeah i mean the I'm, thing ho is, I'm hoping to yeah i mean the thing is you gotta you gotta adapt to the situation Again. Right. So, um, also another thing I wanted to uh, 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 talk to you about was that, um, of course, uh, superhero movies and superhero TV shows are kind of dominating uh, the uh, the entertainment industry right now. Um, and you've been in in a few projects that uh, uh, touch in on that. And uh, one of them, I, I have to admit, I was a big fan of was uh, your role on Gotham. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say New Mutants, but yeah, Gotham was well, a lot of fun. Don't worry. I, 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 I <laughs> will. <laughs> but but I, I wanted to start there because, um, first of all, I mean, you played uh, Deaver Tweed, uh, one mm. of the uh, 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 Tweedle brothers. And yeah. And also, you ended up working with um, uh, the uh, character Mad Hatter, which, I mean, I've always been a big Batman fan. Yeah. And those characters I've always enjoyed, but we haven't really seen. I don't think they've really been utilized up to, I would say, Gotham. I think Gotham is the only time I've really seen them utilized. And I was wondering, oh, were you ever a comic book fan? Uh, is this kind of like a new thing, like, you know, with the video games with you? or? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I used to be a rabid comic book fan. Uh, uh, I mean, but that was a long time ago. So, like, I, I kind of come to these projects similarly to, like you said, as the video games. But I at least have some frame of reference because I used to, you know, just with... CN Marvel and and you know I, I have like the second issue ever of Spider-Man and, okay. and 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 the first ever issue of the Star Wars comic and like I was a rabid collector and then you know I, I, I went on and <laughs> to be more concerned with like girls and booze and then I became a professional actor so yeah. um, <laughs> uh, 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 but it was cool to step back into it I mean especially a set like Gotham where it's like I mean, they create the world. They, I mean, there's sound stages with the different sets. It's like, oh my God, you're you're in it. You're in a comic book. It's a really, it's a really wonderful feeling and vibe. Yeah, comics have always been a lot to kind of keep up with. In my, I never, I appreciate them, but I never got into them because as yeah. you can see, like I collect all by all types of shit that I would have no money to eat if I collected comic books as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's I like know. A, I, I, I'm a big yeah. record collector now myself. I, I got back, back into vinyl. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Like I, I'm trying right now. I'm getting all the stuff that I bought on CD when I was younger. I'm trying yeah. To get my yeah. Collect, build it up. What, what, what do you? What, what else you like to listen to on vinyl over there? Uh, well, I'm I'm a big uh, like really big into like a 1970 uh, outlaw country and and folk music and rock music. I mean, I like everything, but that that's. I have a lot of Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson. Cash? Uh, you get JC? Oh, tons of cash. Oh, dude, I, I love Johnny Cash. I just hunted down um, all the, like, the, the last Rick Rubin albums he did. 
Uh, on oh, America. They're, they're, they're his best albums, I think. Yeah, y'all are doing that. incredible, 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 fantastic. Which one's your favorite? You got all six? I got all six. I like three and uh, oh, maybe three and four three. might be my favorite. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, is three is usually the, the, the least referenced one, but I like yeah, three. Yeah. It's really underappreciated. Solitary Man and all that stuff. That um, I See a Darkness song. I oh, I stumbled into that song at an overnight shift at like three in the morning, just came oh, on Spotify. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. yeah. I'm it's like, like my happening? God. Yeah. It, it sounds like a song that was written for Cash. To, it sounds like a song that was written 50 years ago yeah. for Cash to sing when he's an old man. Yeah. And I, I just they, they they released an album a couple of years ago of songs they lost forever, um, and like they put out an album of it and uh, out among the stars I think is the name of it. Oh yeah, that's and a the, great the, album too. Dude, yeah. that, that that title track out among the stars it blows my mind Beautiful. that got lost because that track is so great. I was like, what they lost it's, this? What it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Midnight in a liquor store in Texas. Um, you know, in, yeah. in 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 the '70s, Waylon and Merle Haggard each each recorded it as well. Did they? Uh, you feel it's like but, the Highwaymen, the super group they did, or something like that? Well, with Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, uh, Willie Nelson. Uh, yeah, Haggard wasn't in the Highwaymen, oh, okay. but uh, um, yeah, they, I have all the Highwaymen albums too. I'm I'm hopeless with that. Oh yeah, that <laughs> stuff's great. I love it. It's great, man. Yeah, I'm glad you get down with that. Yeah, Johnny Cash, man. Johnny Cash is oh. like, wow. It, it all starts and ends with him. I mean, I yeah, should have yes. said that first. Like, every everyone else <laughs> I'm a fan of, it, it like, you know, uh, springs out from him. Yeah. Cash is a weird, he's like beyond music. It's a weird thing. He's like, yeah. He, uh, uh, Chris Christopherson said in a, in a, like a press conference with all four guys, he's like, you know, I'm the I'm the radical lefty. Waylon's the curmudgy right winger. Willie's the pot smoking hippie, and John is the father of our country. There you go, Johnny Cash, <laughs> man. I love Cash. Yeah, so good. I'm glad you're helping keep records alive. That's Fucking amazing. a right, man. Yeah, coming back, coming back heavy. It's good. Yeah, vinyl vinyls are very popular. I have an old Highwayman poster actually from 1985 over there. Hell yeah, nice. nice. I got Hawkman. I got the Hawkman over here, record player. I don't think he's used it once. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I'm like I like find no time to do anything with editing, with filming, with with put it on in the background. It's good for your mind, out, man. I mean, come <laughs> yeah. on. I mean, I'm, I'm literally burning the candle at both ends, hoping not to get wax on my shoes. I mean, nah, that's all right, so. <laughs> we, we understand. <laughs> I don't think he does. I keep on no, trying. I, I, I'm, I'm very understandable, like Alex. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not like Jimmy from the Knicks, killing people. <laughs> like oh, him. yeah, yeah. That that's was, how was you? Super gangster, super gangster. Like straight out of a <laughs> Scorsese movie. I know. I, I, I was so uh, I was so excited to get that job, and I and that was like one of the early ones, you know, where like, oh, Steven Soderbergh is doing a series. I was like, what? Yes, Soderbergh. Yeah, and it was this was great. I love that thing from top to bottom. How was it working with him? It was great. I mean, he, he's uh, you know, him and Fincher are pretty good friends, and uh, mm. and their approaches are totally opposite really i mean totally opposite you know uh, on mindhunter we'd work 15 hour days five days a week for three weeks on my three scenes and uh <laughs> and uh and on the nick i remember there was one day in season two where i did my part of three different episodes in under two and a half hours really that's the different thing but well, because it seems anyway that Stephen he already has it edited in his mind, so he yeah. doesn't he doesn't shoot anything he he knows he won't need. There's no right. coverage. He shoots exactly. I mean, it, it, it's like a it's like watching a surgeon. I mean, it's so precise, so exacting, and uh, there's no wasted time at all, it, or even close. You're like you're in and you're out. Right. And if and and if you don't know your stuff, then like. You you better start because you'll be replaced pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Fincher is more of a relaxed kind of find the grooves type set feel. Or I would I wouldn't describe it like that at all. Yeah, no. yeah, I, I mean, probably shouldn't <laughs> have either. <laughs> uh, 
You know what was great about it, though, was it felt, it didn't feel at all like doing television. I mean, he was so uh, specific and, and, and actually so uh, uh, um, every minute detail that it felt like rehearsing a play every day. The, and cameras just happened to be there. It didn't feel like doing television. Because no film or TV takes that much time to talk about the acting, ever. Yeah. And uh, and he gave very, very specific... I mean, I mean, he looks out for his actors. I, 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 you know, I think back on his movies and I don't know if I can think of a single bad performance of any of the people right. that are in his movies. It's true. Uh, it's so, right. yeah, you can't, no, you can't. no, you, yeah, it's wild. Fincher is uh, iconic, you know, one of the, still going heavy. I think he's, he's nominated for a Director Academy Award this year, right? Mank, yeah. Mank, yeah, Mank, Mank yeah. Uh, I think he'll win. I think he'll win Best Director. I'm rooting for him. All right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, you know, Fitch was one of those dudes. Funny, you know, the Academy Awards pop up. Back in the day, like you had, if you were young or you just made your first film, like they wouldn't even let you get nominated. You know, I know. You, you had to like earn that nomination now. And I'm not saying new filmmakers don't earn it. I'm just saying now it's you'll see someone who popped in, made their first film, and then they'll be nominated for an Academy Award. You know, it's just a different time. But yeah, totally. Fitch, yeah, but you know Fincher is. I love seeing Fincher. He's he's still in it. His his name's always going up for it. Scorsese, his name's always going up amongst these new people, um, and it, I think it bothers the new people. It's weird. I don't know if they have respect. They should. They just want to beat all these older filmmakers. Yeah. I know. I know. It's maddening. Yeah. But um, what you got a favorite Fincher film, real quick, and then Hawk's got a question. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, Zodiac classic i was talking about zodiac last night and you know what's interesting i love that movie and i've seen it many times since i saw it in the theater but i uh, first had a uh, <laughs> an emotional connection to it that was totally unrelated because um i was up for some job and i was walking around the city and i was like i'm gonna go see a movie to take my mind off the job and i was watching zodiac and i was all into it and then in the middle of the movie i got the call it was redacted i got the call that i got redacted oh nice so then so so I didn't go back into the theater that day, and then uh, I made a note to myself: I'm going to have to watch this movie again when I'm out, like you know, uh, like twirling out and flipping out about this thing. And I've since seen it many times, and it's a great movie. And that was a great movie to uh, get good news at because it's it's a dour world that it <laughs> you know oh, yeah. it portrays, but it's it's beautifully shot, of course, and. Amazingly, yeah, it's a fantastic movie. I, I think Zodiac might be his closest film to Mindhunter in a way. You know what I yeah, mean? yeah, absolutely, you know what I mean? yeah. For sure. It is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love Fincher. Fincher's the man. Classic, dude. Uh, Zodiac classic. You know, the hurdy, hurdy-gurdy man hearing that for the first time in a long time was always nice. That's, yeah. one of those, that's one of those songs that you hear the song, you know it's been around forever, but you're like, this song was made for this movie, even though it wasn't, I know. you know what I mean? I know. <laughs> Donovan, classic Donovan. Season of the Witch is a classic jam they should use more in movies. Yeah. Fucking A right. Hell yeah. Um, so, uh, Alex? Yeah, uh, I just want to jump in since we were talking Mindhunter. Yeah. And uh, I, I really want to ask you um, about uh, the character you uh, play, Terry Brutus. Um, how did you, uh, I, I'm assuming you did research uh, and, and all that. Um, one of the things I want to ask you was how, how do you really, I mean, different actors have different ways of getting into a role. So mm -hmm. um, is there a specific um, uh, uh, way you do that? Uh, especially because you, you were fantastic yes. in, that, in that role. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't do the same thing uh, uh, for any, all the jobs. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Jerry Brudos required a, 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 a not insignificant amount of research. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I don't do that for, there's some roles that, that are just so straightforward, they just are what they are. And, yeah. it, and it, it's better to just learn the words and show up rather than mucking it down with all this extra detail that'll maybe make the acting a little overwrought. But Jerry Brudos was such a complicated uh, person, with such a complicated mind. Um, Man, you know, I read the book that was written about him called Lust Killer, and um, I, I researched a lot of stuff online. I couldn't find hardly any video of him, though, which I was kind of upset by, but also kind of uh, relieved because I didn't feel um, 
uh, obligated to like a, an impression um, at all. But it, I also would have loved a little more visuals. I did find this little clip of him where he he says something totally unintelligible. You can't even understand what he's saying. And he cracks himself up for a long time. So that, that's where I borrowed the laugh from. I, I don't know if you remember in the first scene, I enter laughing oh, yeah. and, and, and I keep cracking myself up. That, that was borrowed from that. Um, but, uh, but, and the way I hooked into him emotionally was just his childhood trauma because you, you know, it, you can't, obviously the man himself, I would hate, but you can't think about that. You have to empathize. And, um, and, and that was what keyed me into him was the, the childhood trauma piece and everyone reacts to trauma differently. And his was a very unfortunate way. Yeah, that's the thing with people. It's everybody's human. Where everybody's kind of starts off as the same person, and it's the things that happen to them that should make them do great or yeah. do bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. You never, never, never lose track of that. They're just humans that went astray. Because if you do, it could happen again. Uh, totally, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wow, look at that. Hey. <laughs> uh, being a man of music do you listen to music on the set when when getting into character like if you need to do something you know heavy do you get into like you know heavier music or anything like that i love that question and i always used to i always used to wish that i would get asked that question um <laughs> for years uh when i was doing almost all theater i would pick a different uh tom Waits song that i thought dealt with the inner life of each character and I did that for a long, long time. And uh, and now it's just like, I just make playlists that I'll listen to in the hotel room or in the trailer, just a little. It doesn't play nearly as big of a role as it did when I was younger, but it just kind of helps me. And, and if nothing else, just to be relaxed so I'm open to anything that might happen with the other actor or on the day or whatever. Character-wise, with that playlist that you would create, would you create it for something personal to you that would help you get in yeah. the mood, or would you would you create it maybe what you think that character would like? Well, uh, every character uh, is born from me, so yeah. I, I, it's it's more like my mind in those circumstances. Cool. Uh, is the easiest way to put it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I found years ago that when I tried to like make up my point of view it, it the acting would be kind of fake and overwrought and so now it's just me as if i were in that if i if i were that person i don't right. it's a i don't know i'm not sure if i'm articulating it well but um it's just easier to use images from my own life yeah. and apply them to this other person than to build a whole nother person in my mind yeah i've always been curious when the character is done you know, how hard do you find it to break out of that character, like shed out of that skin? Is it easy or is it more difficult, you know, the darker it is probably, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually 99% of the time it's incredibly easy. Um, but that uh, that mind, <laughs> I, and I was shocked too because this has never happened to me before or since. But when it was done, I was like really depressed and kind of anxious and a little irritable and I was like what is going on and my wife's like well you just played a very disturbed person every day for <laughs> three weeks and I was like is right. that it though she was like yeah that's it yeah um, and, and I remember the, I was there only one day that I was there with Cameron who played Ed Kemper and uh you know we we're the two large killers so we like hit it off and uh <laughs> and, and and he said to me he goes uh He's like, do you find that when you go home, you're, you're kind of like weird and weird to your wife and stuff? And at that time, I was like, no, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And then when I was done, I was like, this is what he was talking about. Oh, fuck. <laughs> no one's immune. Do you think that he was trying to break it when he went home? And do you kind of keep in character till the production's done? You think maybe that was why he was failing it earlier? Uh, maybe. I mean, he had been there a lot longer oh, but, okay. at that point. Um, so he had done a lot more work I, I was just starting he was just finishing yeah. that um, sounds like something he's clash the character him and the character were like clashing heads you know what i mean almost Trying yeah to get out of it you know yeah i don't know I, I i didn't dig that much deeper on that particular topic but but i know i would uh like i i wouldn't stay in character all day i, I think that would that would make me very tired and very yeah. unhappy yeah it's true um, but it was easy. I bet it was also easy. Like when they're setting up the shot, it was, 
the writing was so great and everyone in it was so great. It was easy just to kind of ease into it as, as the cameras started rolling. Yeah. Kishuza. Alexander. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, I have to say that um, uh, looking at everything that you've uh, done and been a part of, you got to work with some very uh, big names. And I mean, you uh, worked with Sandra Bullock in Bird Box. You worked with uh, Will Smith in both Bright and also Bad Boys for Life. And you also worked with one, uh, one of our most real, favorite real quick, you can't, if you're good, real, Sorry to cut you off, Huck. If you're going to bring up Will Smith, you got to bring up Martin Lawrence. You can't just bring up one of them and not the other. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Martin Lawrence also. I prefer to be like Martin Lawrence a little bit better than Will Smith. No offense, no offense, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but you also worked with uh, the great uh, Robert De Niro in the comedian, and yes, yeah. I'm just uh, how were some of those experiences? I mean, uh, that was wonderful working with De Niro. You know, I, I have idolized him since I'm 13. You know, I've been imitating him since I was 13. I could probably uh, say all the lines from Raging Bull like right now. You know. Um, I had met him once before. I was in uh, Merchant of Venice with Al Pacino um, on Broadway and in Shakespeare in the Park, and he came to that. And I talked to them for a little bit, but he didn't remember that, uh, uh, obviously, when I showed up at the comedian. The, uh, the comedian was interesting, too, because the callback, we had to read with Bob. Yeah. He was at the callback, and you had to read with him, um, which was exciting. And and. I was just really grateful for myself that I didn't freak out, that I right. just, you know, treated it like another audition. Cause there were people that went in the room and broke down. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, um, and you just have to like, kind of hit, like psych yourself out. Like, yeah. just going, you know, um, but then he was really lovely on set. He was very generous. Um, you know, I found myself <clears throat> sitting around and talking with him about <laughs> taxi driver and raging, nice. you know, conversations that I fantasized about having since yeah. I was a little kid, you know, right. he was really, really low key and sweet and, and then the cameras get going and he's you know he's a, he's a like a tank but right. um uh and I, I remember this one surreal moment uh you know because again i just acted like there's any other movie but then i watched my stunt double do my scene and he looked he was made I, I i almost always have the same guy this guy chad nor and he was made to look exactly like me and and i saw de niro charging him and punching him i was like Oh my God, I'm in a scene with Robert De Niro. <laughs> but I, I had to watch my stunt double do it to truly appreciate the, the reality of it. Tell, tell, tell the stunt double that him getting beat up in The Comedian is better than De Niro beating up the other guy in The Irishman. <laughs> 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 Which I love The Irishman too. A lot of people hate it on The Irishman. I loved it, I thought it was great. I found a lot of love and hate from people. Yeah. I loved it. I really loved it. But yeah. I'm such a sucker for those guys that I might not be the best person to ask. But People were complaining it was too long. It's like, why well, complain a movie's too long? You, you and every Scorsese too. movie, every Scorsese yeah. movie's three hours. What did exactly. you think you were getting into? Right. And you're at home. You can watch it at home. Don't complain. Yeah, yeah pause. Take a nap <laughs> if you feel like it. The fuck it's out crazy. of it. too long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're the, they're the same people that you know, they want to win the Best Director Academy Award over Martin Scorsese. Same <laughs> yeah. people. Uh -huh. It's the same damn people. That's right. Bad boys, bad, huh? Yeah, everyone. Yeah. You know, no one wants out. to, you know, sit down and watch, you know, a long movie. And and it's like, you know, I mean, it's, it's all about the story. I mean, if it's a, you know, bad story stretched over three hours, yeah, I can definitely understand not wanting to sit, but when it's a, a great story, you know, I know you want to stay from beginning, middle and end. You want to see it all go through all kind. You want to see the characters go through all kinds of emotions, all kinds of turmoil to the end. That that's the payoff, whether it takes, you know, uh, an hour, two hours or, or four hours. I mean, that, that the story and, and the characters is what, you know, what brings you in the reason why you watch and, and it's the whole reason you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I always believe that the the length of the movie should be uh, only uh, decided by the length that it needs to be to tell the story right. 
that's a great way to put it. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. 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 It takes what it takes. That's it. Yeah. And and then you know, and if and of course nowadays with everything on streaming, you you're watching at home. Like you said, you can always pause it if you you find it's going a little too long. Take a little break. Get back to it. And yeah, I, man. That's, that's the way I see it when it comes to you know films, especially a good story. I mean, a good story takes as long as it takes to you know tell the you story. T- you take Martin Scorsese; they'll complain now, but do you know how much people are gonna miss him when he when he's gone? And they're gonna say, "I oh wish we God. had another Martin Scorsese movie." Of course. You know what I mean, of course, it's just the way it is. Unfortunately, you know. Yeah. It's the nature of the beast. Marty will never have to go to friends to make movies. They will always let him make movies here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there'll always be someone to pay the exorbitant budget which fine yeah. pay it i don't care make those I, movies i would too you know the most I, I i find inspiration later in life in a situation that came with marty where that silence movie that he made was a passion project that he wanted to make for fucking 30 years and he couldn't make it nobody would fund it and the fact that nobody would fund a scorsese movie give it you know it, it's it's like it makes you feel better when you can't get your movie done. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's not like I'm not a piece of garbage. You just can't get this movie done. It's everybody. And even the people at the hot, like I do, there's very few people bigger than Scorsese in this industry. And he still has trouble getting movies made. So you get oh my God, you know, a lot. Yeah. Like, he has a lot of trouble. A lot of That's trouble. Why he goes yeah. to Netflix. Yeah. Well, he, I think he comes into that issue where that Lucas came into where like, you have all these passion projects, but they only want to see ma- mafia movies. They only want to see yeah. Star Wars movies from you. You know right. what I mean? And you want to make these other things, but nobody wants to fund those other things because they want the new, they want Goodfellas too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I remember there was otherwise kind of, known as Casino. <laughs> yeah, which is a classic, very I lovely film. I think, I think it's really underappreciated. I it love is. Casino. Casino is great. There's uh, all his movies are solid. There was talks of doing Taxi Driver two at one point, which is a horrifying. That, dog. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want that to happen. I couldn't even imagine. Ugh, scary, very scary stuff. What, we hope to see you in a Martin movie soon. Oh, you, you from your lips to God's ears. Hell friend. yeah, we'll put in the call. Yeah. All right, thank you. Now, Martin's on our speed dial. We'll give him a call. Don't worry, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's got something being developed as we speak. Yeah, the next Happy Anderson project. Hell yeah! Hey, the untitled Scorsese and Happy Anderson project. <laughs> I support. We can put that on IMDb and get that ball moving today. <laughs> He'll either come calling or his lawyer will come calling. One or the other. That's right. <laughs> hey, come on! There's no such thing as bad publicity, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Yeah. That's what they tell me. <laughs> it's true. So but, your most current film is The New Mutants. You know what I mean? How, yeah. How'd that come about? I know you said recently you've been getting into more, last couple of years, it's been more of offers instead of auditioning. So, you know, how, you know who, 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 who liked you and said, let's go get this guy in that situation? Yeah, yeah. Josh uh, Boone uh, had seen me in the Nick and this other series that I loved that not very many people saw called Quarry. Um, had seen me in both of those and he, he asked me to do it. He's like, yeah, look, it's just one scene, but I think you'd be great. And, uh, and it was, it was, I had a, that was another one. I had just a fantastic time. Josh was great. Maisie was great. And we just, you know, kind of played all day. And the, the, the only unpleasant part was the hours of makeup on my, from yeah. my face. Yeah, that's tough. What, when you do a big makeup job like that for a film, what, what do you, how, how many hours before the actual shoot day do you have to roll into set for that? Uh, well, we did a makeup test the day before that took like four hours, but then on the day of the, that we shot, uh, it took like under two hours since we, since they already, we already knew what we were doing. Yeah. And you guys, you usually start up around like a six or seven. Yeah. Yeah. Something like, actually, I would probably, I probably had to come in around five that day. Yeah. Um, but it's fine. I mean, I, I think I, I literally only worked one day on that thing. So it was, I was game for any of it you know and i assume it's touch-ups all day long or is that something that just like stays no well in that case it was just like it was it was set like you couldn't it couldn't be moved, don't, so okay yeah you couldn't yeah. screw it up or and you also couldn't make it better it just was what it was yeah <laughs> i'm always curious about that stuff because even the stuff that looks simple 
the, the, the science behind it could be like, you know, everything holding together. Uh, these people are so talented. Oh, yeah, 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 I mean, for sure. I mean, my God, I don't even know how they think, conceive of how to do those things, but that's not my job, so I don't need to think about it. The money helps, I hear. Yeah, that's yeah, I hear. Hear. <laughs> that, That's the rumor down the pipeline. Yeah, but that's, that's I mean, that's top of the food chain effects right there. Biggest movie of the year going down. That's great shit. Yeah. Yeah, I actually did that three or four years ago. Yeah. I know yeah. we're all behind. We're all like two years behind because of the goal. Yeah, totally. It's so weird. So what's it like when you when you start off at a nice horror, you know, brutal massacre film, and then <laughs> you step foot on uh, you know, the new mutants, which I assume the entire budget of Brutal Massacre was like the lunch, like what people ate for lunch that day on the first day of the new mutants, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much like that. Yeah. yeah, when I did Brutal Massacre, I had nothing else to compare it to. So I was yeah. like, oh, this is fun. And then by the time I did New Mutants a few years ago, I was like, man, I can't believe what I used to put up with. <laughs> That's uh, one, you know. one giant leap for mankind right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good though, man. You're a good man. You're a super talented guy. We're glad to see this stuff's going good for you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's so nice. I really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Another uh, thing I, I wanted to uh, to ask you about is that uh, another thing that I, I've noticed is a common trend is uh, taking like uh, films and then making them into TV series. A perfect example is Snow uh, Snowpiercer. Oh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, it's funny because um, I don't know if, if you know this, but different countries with Netflix have different shows. I um, didn't know that. Yeah. Well, it, it was funny because uh, beginning of this year, I went to uh, Romania to shoot a uh, independent film. Mm. And when I was there, uh, they had Netflix in it. And I watched it and I watched Snowpiercer. Um, I think they only had like the first season, but I can't get Snowpiercer on Netflix here. So, I mean, I just, I just found that interesting. That's bizarre. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was happy because I wanted to see the series, but you know, I only got Netflix as streaming series goes and, <laughs> and I really am able to get on anything else. So I, I was really happy to see it. And I thought you did a great job in that. Yes. In Thank that you. TV yes. series. Thank you. The most bizarrest Snowpiercer story I ever heard came from this gentleman over here where he tried to connect the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, I believe, <laughs> to Snowpiercer. Could you rewalk me through that conversation again? No, no, no. It, was, it wasn't me. I, um, I don't know if, if, if you know this, Happy. But, oh, I see. I kind of get it. Yeah. What were you uh, saying? Th th there was... Um, now, this happened like a few years ago where... You know, a bunch of people, you know, like to take uh, movies or TV series and, and make connections, like, you know, saying Mary Poppins is some, uh, she was like uh, smoothly connected to uh, like the Harry Potter universe because of the stuff she did was so similar to like what they could do in Harry Potter and all that. But there was one where uh, a bunch of people connected that um, like, um, uh, uh, the guy who was the one who ran the train, um, blank Wilford. Out. Yeah, Wilford. That he's actually Charlie Bucket all grown up, and that, oh my god, and that you know that uh, the that uh, it, it's. I mean, I I could I could spend like uh, forever trying to remember and go through all the different connections they had. They had one where you know. Wilford uh, uh, is is mentioned. His name's mentioned, and you see a bucket slowly being lifted uh, during that. And then you got uh, another. Oh my God! Where you're saying that um, uh, the the uh, Tilda Swinton character is actually Reluca Salt's character, all grown up. And <laughs> I know, I know, but I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's possible. Yeah, and and the thing is, until you actually talk to the director who actually directed it, I mean, there could be, you know, he could have been inspired by Charlie and used those kind of ideas and then made his own world out of it, or could be just, you know, someone with a lot of time. 
their hands. Yeah. You know, going through each scene, I'm like, ooh, making these, you know, uh, connections. But it you was know what's funny. I used to have a lot of those uh, theories and stuff but when, when I was just a fan of movies. And, stuff. and now all these years that I see it, what, what actually, the reality of it, I'm like, oh, there's almost never a connection to anything. It's just what happened to happen on that day. Yeah. Um, but it's possible. Listen, it's possible. Mm-hmm. But I've also read theories about stuff that I've been in. I'm like, that. that's amazing that you got that from that. Because I just happened to pick that thing up because it was there. Right. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, so how was the experience in, on on that set? Now that set, I'm assuming, was all on uh, sound stages, and yeah, 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 in Vancouver. Yeah, and uh, also very confined. I'm, I mean, did they keep you on set like throughout your scenes, or was there, you know, because I know on some sets, especially if they're a confined area. Sometimes uh, directors like to keep uh, their actors like in that spot throughout the entire show. Uh, try to, you know, get the claustrophobic kind of feel going, and and yeah, all that. uh, was that the situation? No, that's really interesting. Uh, no, I mean it, it, it was it was like shooting anything. Um, I, I, I liked the the room that I was in. Usually, I really enjoyed because they had me. There had originally been the storyline about my entire family uh dying before i boarded the train so they put up all these pictures of me and my wife my actual wife and my nephews to represent my dead family so i i like i really enjoyed being there with that i thought that was fun um but of, of course they cut any reference to that so they just look like pictures yeah but, but- uh, the big thing is uh, going off of that, which I I consider, I mean, no matter what role I play, I consider like uh, the uh, major building block of, of acting and, and playing a role is always the backstory. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. And um, I know that, I mean, I've talked to some people that, you know, they don't spend much time. They just, you know, go in, they do the lines, they create the uh, situation that they're in and don't give a lot of uh, backstory to the characters. And I've always believed that, you know, that get, uh, to, to do the best possible job, you gotta, because you always have to understand whenever you see someone on, on, on film or all that, that they've already had a life before that point. And mm. I always consider it a big thing to, you know, uh, you know, build up uh, the backstory of no matter how uh, small or big your character is to, you know, help kind of make you feel, I guess, more with the character. I mean, at least that's mm-hmm. how I find. How, how do you feel on that, though? Well, yeah, I, I mean, there's some characters where I think that, that I played where I think that's essential, where I, 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 I literally needed it. Um, there were other characters not so much, and there were other characters where I, other kinds of jobs where I found that thinking about all that was just, it was too much. It, it bogged, when it, when it was a very straightforward scene that needed to be streamlined to deliver information. If, if I had all that information in my head, it was just, it made it too mucky. So I've kind of learned that, I kind of instinctually know which jobs require a lot of prep, which, which jobs I should do no prep, and which jobs, you know, in the middle. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, and, and also another thing um, I wanted to ask you is that uh, when when it comes to I, I've noticed you've you've played a lot of different uh, roles in different time periods. Is there like a different is there like a, a time period that you just enjoy being in, uh, whether it's the the uh, atmosphere, whether it's the clothes you get to wear or just the mentality of the characters you get to play? Any any like preference or feeling in, in that respect? The nineteen seventies is by far my favorite. Yeah. Um, the that show I, I said I talked about before, Quarry, was yeah. set in the early nineteen seventies, and, and you know I played a detective and I, I wore all these seventy suits, and there's all these references, you know, like I said to wait. I knew uh, the writers became pretty good friends of mine and we had the exact same taste in music so yeah. we'd reference like a Waylon Jennings song or a Chris Christopherson song and that was I had such a wonderful time on that show but also in that era 
you know, every set was built to look exactly like the 1970s. And, I, I, and I've been in other 1970s things, and I do like that vibe in that era very much. I mean, I was born in 76, so I guess I'm partial to it. But, um, um, but that era and that job in particular, I have a lot of affinity for. Yeah, I think I think the era that people come from where they were born and stuff, I think is heavy with that. Like we're eighties, we're eighties. Like I'd love to do a film in the eighties, you know what I mean? I even like Yeah, 80s. yeah. Nineties yeah. is a fun time too. You guys see I Tanya? I loved I Tanya. That was great. I loved I Tanya. Yeah. Great. It yeah. was perfect, perfect capsule of the nineties. I thought that was great. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. That, that was I was back in high school when I saw that movie. And it was like very well done too. I was hoping it was going to win the best film that year. Cause uh, what's her name? She's uh, great. She's fantastic in it. And the she's... way that she, yeah, the way she played it where it was like, she, she, how it showed her how the mother treated her bad and like the boyfriend. And like, there was a, there was an element where like the abuse, the, the, the boyfriend flips into abuse and the way that it was played was so like realistic to how it is where I don't know. I can't, you have to see the movie. Everybody here has seen it, but anybody listening, you'd have to see it. But I really liked how they meshed the, you know, she, she was like a victim in her own sense. You know what I mean? Like she did these yeah. things, but she was really just kind of back against the wall, looking at everything in her life, falling apart away from her. You know what I mean? She was just trying to survive. And she thought that in her mind, she thought that was her only survival choice, you know? Yeah. yeah See, it's that's beautiful. The, the beauty of that film is that people can relate now and look at, look at it in that way. Totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's not just some nutcase. She's like, yeah. A, a person who's hurting that has fears and dreams yeah yeah it, yeah. it was beautifully done and life got a lot harder for her after that too you know what i mean Fuck it it ain't right, yeah. uh, is she still with us i think she is right Tanya. oh yeah yeah, yeah. i think she so, was yeah. uh she was in some uh she she did a, like a celebrity boxing oh, show and yeah. then she did a she did a, she's done some stuff she's more famous than nancy carrigan in the end Believe by it. far you know, yeah no yeah. one even remembers who nancy kerrigan was hardly sorry nancy kerrigan <laughs> <laughs> i happen to be a fan of them both me too me too i yeah, have her yeah. tattooed across my neck <laughs> on back, only on the back only on the back yeah <laughs> well of course what else would it be only on the back uh, every favorite name of mine is tattooed on the back of my neck that's right absolutely <laughs> then you don't have to look at it all right happy man this was a great time alex do you have any more uh questions um uh actually i just have uh one more um i think i i read that uh you you actually um you teach an acting class right yeah well i used to i used to teach at a lot of different places now i independently uh just teach a a one-day workshop on auditioning for the camera Oh, cool, cool. I mean, um, is uh, are you still doing that right now through like Zoom or? I do that, yeah, yeah. I've been doing that through Zoom uh, uh, during the pandemic. I hope to do it in person again eventually because it's it's really really great in person. But on Zoom, it's it still works. It's very effective, and we all seem to enjoy it. But uh, yeah, it's 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 something. It's something else that I also really enjoy. Uh, you know, if I'm not working as an actor, at least I'm working with actors when I do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing uh, better than, you know, just experience, even, even if you're just doing it uh, with yourself, a bunch of friends, just, you know, you know, taking yeah. scene, dissecting and, you know, playing, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I could do that stuff for hours and hours and hours, breaking down scripts, you know, yeah. it's like, so, you know, uh, another income source but it's also the only other thing that I enjoy <laughs> you know yeah. when I used to have day jobs I would lose them all the time because I was like I fucking hate this and, <laughs> and so once I got into the you know the teaching and then I increased my acting jobs around the same time uh, so I'd always have that in between jobs to go back to in between acting jobs to go back to which was great that's nice yeah. that's that's really good. I mean, um, and it's, I have to admit, I mean, I've, I, I got a regular day job that, you know, got to do to pay the bills and, and all sure. that. And uh, it, it's funny uh, when people, uh, because I work during, you know, Monday through Friday and then on the weekends, 
all I do is film, acting, auditions, you know, anything else I can. And so I always joke around that I literally have no day off. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you don't. And I don't, but uh, but it's it's funny because uh, I'd be talking with some of my acting friends and I, I'd be making a comment to them about, you know, how I, the acting world, acting itself at times is like extremely crazy with everything that goes on. But yeah. craziness helps me deal with the other craziness of, of my regular. Totally, life. dude. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and if it wasn't for that, I'd probably <laughs> lose my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm I'm right there with you, man. It's it's almost like uh like a drug addiction, like you need your fix. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Sure. I mean, it's uh, as it's it's funny. I mean, it's I mean, when I got uh college, you know, no no one told me, you know, how to get into acting and all that. And and I live in Boston and and all that. So there's not a lot of uh, big you know, like theater companies and all that, that I could find my way getting myself into. So I did a lot of community theater. And I mean, the feeling of, you know, the, the, uh, the pause and, and all that at the end, I mean, is, is yeah. probably one of the best feelings ever. I mean, oh my God, totally. Yeah, just, just hearing that clapping, I mean, makes, makes all the, you know, the, uh, the uh, hard work worthwhile, I find. Yeah. A hundred percent. That that's the first thing I was addicted to, and then the process uh, soon superseded that. But the first thing I loved yeah. was the attention and the affirmation. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. You know, we got we got a lot of actors and filmmakers that listen to this page. So without asking anything about the craft, you know, in a business with so many ups and downs, what do you find the best way to kind of even out the balance of like discard getting discouraged over something or finding you know being able to say, well, this thing didn't work but there will be another one. Do you have any advice or words of uh, support like that for somebody? Yeah. Like yeah. Well, first thing I would say is if you don't have them develop other passions. So, you know, any other thing that you care deeply, like I'll never care about anything as much as I care about acting, but over the years, uh, you know, it, well, even if it's, you know, whatever record collecting or going to a Mets game or whatever, or going to a museum, it's a little different in, in the, in the um, pandemic, but um you know, I read all the time things that have nothing to do with acting, just because it's such a hot and cold business. And, and it's a deeply personal business, but you can take absolutely nothing personally. Because at the end of the day, it has nothing in the world to actually do about you, even though it feels like it has everything to do about you, because it's you're, you're the product. But I always tell my students this too, actually, when you finish an audition, or when you leave an audition, um, you should never, I, I learned this over time, you should never ever ask yourself, did I nail it, did I crush it, did I get the job, any of that stuff. You should ask yourself two questions. Did I tell the truth? And did I enjoy myself? And if you can say yes to both of those, then it's a victory. And the call, if you happen to get the call afterwards, then that's the cherry on top. But the audition is the job. It's an opportunity to do your job. And the other thing I like to say about it is it's the opportunity to share your story through other people's words. Yeah. Amen, brother. That that passion thing is an important, and I don't think anybody's ever brought that up. That's very important. Because uh, when he says that, he's not saying find an outlet of something other than what you're trying to do. He's saying find something else that you care about as much. So when that certain thing or takes even a almost hit, as much. Yeah. So when that certain thing, if it takes a hit, you're, that's not your everything taking that hit. You can still fall back on other loves that can keep you kind of going throughout. You know what I mean? Very wise, very wise words. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs> hey, well, happy. This has been great, man. We really appreciate you coming on the show. We'd love to have you on again. You ever want to come on? You're always welcome. And, uh, My pleasure. We'll, Thank we'll you. Stay guys. in contact. Yeah, we're gonna follow you to the sky and beyond. And when we see you in that Scorsese movie, we want that interview. <laughs> you, this is the first place I'm coming. In the movie, yeah. We want that interview with, when we when you're in the movie. Uh, you heard him. You heard him here first. He said it. <laughs> uh, also, uh, uh, if anyone there's happens to be interested in my class, follow me at Happy Ander Happy Anderson Acting on Instagram. Yes. 
definitely and go support all the films and the tv work and support them in general you know follow them you see there's something coming out with them in it watch it support it you gotta support people if you don't support people they won't be here anymore and that's everybody you know that is everybody that's you right know? so yeah. again, happy happy feels like he's on the set of bad boys again with me and alex up here because we're so bad to the bone <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> why do you think I? Why do you think I did this interview? I was like, uh, you know, the two white bad boys. <laughs> like We're gonna it. change the name of the show now. Bad yeah, boys, yeah. Boom, master cast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great day over there. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, guys. Word up. All right, folks. Well, with that being said, happy Anderson. It was a pleasure. Yeah. The pleasure is mine, fellas. Hell yeah. Thanks. We'll, we'll catch all y'all on the next episode of the Boombastic Cast.